I'm Camilla Tomini, I'm Associate Editor of The Telegraph and a long-standing royal commentator. Well, I suppose if I think back to Harry and Meghan's wedding, it was kind of the culmination of quite a few years work in the sense that we had broken the story of their relationship on the Sunday Express. So it was October 2016 when I managed to glean that Harry was going out with this woman called Meghan Markle, who was an American actress. And that was quite a significant scoop for me and for the newspaper. And then to see it evolve into this extremely serious relationship that then led to marriage at Windsor Castle, obviously sort of completed the circle of that particular romance for Prince Harry. All we were interested in really was who this girl was, the nature of her being really glamorous, this sense that she was a ready-made royal because if you googled her you found her addressing the UN and doing stuff for charity. So it was like, my goodness, this is a you know, proper significant player in the whole sort of scene and that she was famous and I think the overwhelming feeling was even though he was one of the world's most eligible bachelors there was this sense that Prince Harry was massively punching above his weight. It's never just about the day you know there is a week-long build-up I was there in a kind of multimedia capacity because as well as writing reams for the Sunday Express, I also was there in a broadcasting capacity, largely broadcasting on the day for NBC. Well, this is as good a time as any as we watch these arrivals to talk about our team of royal experts and we've got the heavyweights. Uh, we've got a proper introduction for them, okay? NBC's royal editor, Camilla Tomini. NBC had decided to basically rent out the whole of the McDonald Hotel in Windsor Town Centre which has got an amazing vista from the roof straight onto the front of St George's Chapel. They put up this rig where we would be broadcasting from, which was one of the most impressive sort of standalone structures I've ever seen. They had an absolute bird's eye view to the front door of the chapel, knowing that when they were rolling live, they would have astonishingly unrivaled images. I couldn't believe it, like I was here on Monday and somebody was sleeping overnight from then, covered in Union Jack flags. When you're commentating it though, you're very much trying to translate for the TV audiences exactly how it feels on location. Things happened like the MNS changed its name to I think Markle and Sparkle. The sun was shining, you couldn't have wished for better weather. There was just a real royal buzz about the place. You'd expect that with Windsor anyway, because it's a royal town, but in this regard, I just think there was a huge amount of goodwill behind the couple. So happy for the boat, it's amazing. I think you get goosebumps as soon as the bride appears, because no one knows what she's going to be wearing. And it looks to be an exquisitely cut, and in many ways, minimal and traditional dress with a splendid veil. This sense of seeing her in all of her finery is a bit of a kind of take a breath moment. I mean, when the carriage came past, I ran downstairs to see it because I wanted to see it with my own eyes like any punter that might have queued up overnight for a sight of the couple in the flesh, there was this sense that I was there and I wanted to say that I was actually there. She's beautiful, they yeah. look so, oh, they look so <laughs> cute! You commentate up to the point of the ceremony, so when you're on television you're like, oh look, there's Zara Phillips, she's arrived with her husband Mike Tyndall, and there's Princess Anne, and there's Oprah Winfrey. As soon as the ceremony happens, from a commentary point of view, obviously you have to go silent because you just let the ceremony speak for itself. <laughs> Journalistically and just from human nature, you're very much tuned into some of the body language. And it was really clear this sense to which the couple were totally besotted with one another. And that really came across in the church. So I suppose that chemistry between them provided goosebumps because it was really clear that they were deeply in love with each other. I think everyone was crying around here, we were all crying, it was really moving wasn't it? Yeah. People very much wanted to see, first of all Meghan's mother Doria kind of welcomed into the bosom of the royal family and there was some consternation about where she was sat in the pews and this idea that she was a bit separated from the rest of the crowd. But equally 
there was a lot of focus on the Prince of Wales and how he was going to step up and walk Meghan down the aisle in the absence of her own father. And that almost represented her proper welcome into the royal family, this sense that the future king was going to walk his daughter-in-law down the aisle, sort of cemented her place in the House of Windsor at the time. So I think that was quite a magical moment as well. When her mum was involved in Charles, breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. I think the music really captivated hearts and minds, the evangelical choir playing, that fantastic musician on a cello. I suppose Bishop Curry was the one unexpected and kind of the element that you couldn't quite predict what he was going to say. And when he gave this impassioned sermon about the power of love, seemingly invoking Frankie Goes to Hollywood, mixed with sort of Jennifer Rush, it was quite a moment. And I remember the two co-hosts that I was with kind of saying, golly, this is going on for some time. And it, and it did go on, but it was kind of just a really refreshing take on a thoroughly modern wedding. By the point that the couple in this particular instance had sort of changed outfits, changed cars and gone off to the evening reception at Frogmore, which very much is considered completely off limits to journalists, the theory is that the royals say, well, look, you can have the day bit and you've got all of the um, photographs and you've got everything you want from the ceremony. Fill your boots. We'll even give you some insight into what's been said at the daytime reception. But when it comes to the evening do, sorry, no cameras allowed, no journalists, stay out. And if you can pick up some detail the following day, good luck to you. But as far as we're concerned, we've given you everything we're going to give you. So at that point, journalistically, there's not that much more you can do. bride looking radiant. The big moment happens. It's gone out live on air across goodness knows how many countries. Everyone's been tuned in around the world. I was then personally in the situation where I came off broadcast and it's not over for me because I've then got to write the whole lot up, file my copy in time for the deadline for the following morning's newspaper. And actually the emotion then is a massive sort of come down. And I remember being in the hotel, like literally the main talent of NBC, I think they'd already left. They were already on planes back to New York. And I remember filing my copy and like everyone had gone. And then you sort of, I don't know, you feel a bit depressed about it all. Like you've had a great build up and then it's over. It's really weird. It's so much build up and then suddenly it's all finished. To have a kind of ringside seat in history is obviously something you never forget and I'm lucky to have been that close to the action and it's kind of a remarkable thing to be among that small minority, the so-called royal press pack that actually does get this front row seat. So that's something you always cherish and those are the sort of jobs that you live for as a royal correspondent. I suppose reflecting on it now, post Megxit, several years on, there's a degree of upset. Lots has been said and written about the press's treatment of the couple and whether the Duchess of Sussex has sort of been unfairly vilified. People forget that when she first came on the scene, there was a huge amount of excitement and support for her and who she was and what she represented and what a breath of fresh air she would be for the House of Windsor. The goodwill among the public for them as a couple was enormous um, and that's easily forgotten. You go back to the original footage of that day and you see William and Harry together and you remember how magical and remarkable it all was and it makes you feel sad that they're no longer a part of the royal family. We're all familiar with how difficult family life can be I've never been under any illusions though that the royal family is sort of less nuclear and more thermonuclear and there's a dysfunctional nature to it all and in many ways when it all falls apart for the royals it endears them more to us as the public because it makes them seem more normal and human and more like us than them and particularly having spent many many years observing William and Harry in close quarters and now seeing that they are, to quote Prince Harry, on different paths, that's a sad thing. <laughs>